Hello, everyone. Welcome back. We have Seth and Justin here again to have another excellent guest on. We have a representative from Samurai Wallet here. Uh, so it's always great to have uh, people who are working on projects related to privacy in the ecosystem. It'll be great to have their thoughts going back and forth. And we have, uh, uh, we've been told that uh, you really like a conversational type setting. So I would just like to kick us off and uh, give you a chance to introduce yourself. How would you like to be referred to? And uh, of course, there's tons, I think, to learn about. Well, yeah, thank you. Thank you guys for having me. Uh, I'm usually referred to in these sorts of settings as a samurai or uh, my my kind of unofficial nim within the within within our internal group is wallet guy. That's what uh, it started out as. <laughs> um, but samurai is fine. That's how most people uh, uh, refer to me. And um, I guess yeah, I guess I've never really uh, done a non-Bitcoin uh, interview or podcast, so maybe your community isn't aware of Samurai Wallet at all. So Samurai Wallet is a privacy-focused Bitcoin wallet, essentially. We started in 2015, um, a little bit after the uh, kind of fall of Dark Wallet, when that kind of didn't take off. Uh, we wanted to pick up where that left off, and we felt that uh, the space was kind of turning... Um, turning in a direction we didn't like. We felt like there was too much of a focus on acquiring uh, mass adoption without the building blocks of protocol level privacy. Um, now, we immediately recognized that getting protocol level privacy in Bitcoin was gonna be a real uphill struggle. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and instead of just kind of sitting around doing nothing, we said, well, let's just let's go for app level privacy. If that's what we can do, let's do it. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's that's kind of how we started. That was the genesis of Samurai uh, is just me and my co-founder, TWD. And uh, yeah, we built it out, you know, out of pocket and to where it's at today, which we just passed 100,000 downloads. I found out yesterday. So that's or yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, it's pretty exciting. Yeah, I saw the announcement you gave on Twitter. R really cool stuff. Do you know how many of those are active users? I mean, because uh, I, not, that, I, not that you would be collecting the data, of course, but I know that Google well, Play would be. Yeah, exactly. So we obviously have no trackers or analytics in the app itself, um, but we do have distribution through Google Play, and we do have an idea of Google Play numbers, which uh, I haven't looked at them yet since since I saw the 100K. But last time I looked, it was around 50, I want to say, 50 to 60 active and 60,000 uh, active. And the way that Google records that number is they've opened the app at least once in two weeks. Hmm. Uh, so I think that's a really good, really good number. But what, really, it's kind of difficult because we have distribution, obviously, uh, from a direct download APK um, off of our GitLab. And we have, of course, people who build from source. So you know, there is a wide variety of people. And, and the type of user that we attract uh, they're more likely to be building from source or downloading the direct APK. Yeah, understandable. <laughs> it was we we had a this is well off topic, but we had a the Monero website was compromised at one point, and I was just astonished at how quickly someone uh, actually hashed the, the the files that they had downloaded and how quickly people noticed that it was malicious. Like just the overlap of people that actually do that with the Monero community. I'm sure in your case, the people that are likely to not download something on Google Play are you know, quite significant compared to most other communities, just because people actually care. Definitely. And even the people who don't know how to uh, verify the hash, they come into our telegram and ask, you know, mm -hmm. because they see the signature file on the website and they go, what do I do with this? And we walk them through it, you know, and, and um, even I think there's somewhere on the website now that actually tells them what to do and how to do it uh, because they want, they want to learn and they're already interested in privacy because that's why they've stumbled into Samurai. Uh, so we should, you know, give them a helping hand to achieve that. Of course. So you talked a little bit about what got you interested in the crypto. Well, like, uh, a little bit about your background and getting into the cryptocurrency space, I guess, why is focusing on privacy super important to you? I know you saw that, you know, Bitcoin was out there and, and you thought protocol privacy is probably not likely to really come on quickly or, or, you know, at any point, and it'll be different than, than what we all perhaps want. Um, but what, what made you actually take the leap to focus on building out this application? Well, I wanted, I, I always saw Bitcoin, when I got into Bitcoin, it was in 2013, actually, and it was very, for a very, very utilitarian reason. I needed to move money from the US to the UK. Um, and at the time, 
it was an expensive thing to do. There wasn't like transfer wise and stuff like that, uh, which make it relatively cheap nowadays. Um, and, and Bitcoin offered that I was able to acquire it. Uh, I think I used like, a like at a grocery store, I was able to buy some voucher or something and reclaim. I didn't have to give any information over. Um, it was pretty straightforward and, um, I was able to, to do it. So that worked for me. And I was like, okay, this is cool. And what it, what it to me came down to was this is a digital uh, form of cash, like not like cash as in the form of, of if you're familiar with some Bitcoin history, like Roger Veer uh, would refer to Bcash as cash in the form is like cold, hard greenbacks, like fungible, fungible dollars in your, your under the table dollars, as I sometimes call them. That's what I saw Bitcoin as, and 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 uh, privacy is an essential part of that. Um, if you don't have the freedom to transact and the freedom, uh, then you don't have any freedom. That's one of our fundamental rights, uh, I believe. And well, I shouldn't say fundamental rights because I don't actually believe in in that per se. I like to say that privacy is a human fight because the only rights you have are the ones you're willing to fight for. Um, so, but but getting back to what I was saying, yeah. Um, Privacy, when it comes down to actually using the token or ideally on the protocol level, but as I already said, that's not really something that I don't, I see happening, uh, at least something in the app level. Um, and um, like I said, there wasn't anything really out there. So we wanted to build it for us, primarily. <laughs> that's why we built Samurai Wallet. Sounds like you conned a few other people into using the wallet too uh, along the way. Um... So some I guess, would say that, yeah. <laughs> some would say, right? Um, so I guess in an ideal world, if you were able to snap your fingers and implement or make consensus changes to actually add on-chain privacy features to Bitcoin, what would that look like in your opinion? What would you actually like to see there? Well, you know, really it's a tough question because, I mean, I'll be honest with you, I'm not smart enough to to come up with the trade-offs and the distinctions and all that stuff i've heard other people's arguments of course um so you know i i think it's a a shielded transaction amounts confidential transactions would be something that is essential uh yeah. with the provision that the trade-offs are, are are manageable right where there's some form of auditability uh and and I think that's that's really a, bit, a basic minimum, to be honest with you. Um, everything that we do at Samurai comes down to the fact that you know every, it, we have a public ledger with the amounts that are are easily uh, easily viewed and the input outputs that can be easily um, easily determined without without some form of action by the user, like using the tools that we provide. So one of the tools we provide is a kind of a head nod to a confidential transaction type. Um, because the output amount is, is masked. You don't know what the true amount sent was. Only the, the sender and the recipient know. Um, it's not bulletproof. It's definitely not a confidential transaction, but it's a distortion, right? It, it breaks the, the, the assumptions that, a, that an observer uh, has when they're looking at these types of transactions. They don't know what the amount sent was, for example. Um, so I, yeah, I think that confidential transactions would be one. Um, and again, it's, a, it's not going to happen. Like, I, I mean, I'm yeah, pretty no. confident in saying it's not going to happen. Um, you know, we saw <laughs> just trying to raise the block size limit, which I wasn't necessarily for. I was for SegWit. Um, but just doing that, the, the, the disrupt, disruption that caused, the break in the community that caused. I mean, there was a split. There was a fork. Um, and, and, and then there's been forks of forks and all it's all come like from that Genesis. And that was basically a non issue. Imagine <laughs> trying to get a protocol change, like confidential transactions. It's, it's a non-starter, you know, and the longer time goes on, it's a non it's a, the more difficult and the more impossible it becomes in my view. Yeah. That's one of those where like, if you could get confidential transactions, which I think like Justin, you usually refer to them as confidential amounts. Cause it's a little clear the whole CT term. Yeah. Is a little confusing to people but if you could get that in bitcoin that would open up a, a whole host of new ways that you could provide privacy to users because you have that one massive glaring heuristic that you can just throw out the window or at least make harder to track 
Um, and that would be like, uh, I mean, obviously in the Monero community, that is is a bare minimum that's a building block of how we do privacy. And it's just kind of like an accepted thing in this community. So it is definitely interesting interacting with people in Bitcoin, especially with all of the like the 21 million coins is the max, like auditability is kind of sacred in Bitcoin. So it's interesting to try to see to see the two different ethos yeah, and I, and I agree. Like, I'm one of those people that do agree that the the 21 million is an important attribute of Bitcoin. And I agree that I would like to be able to audit the that there is no more than 21 million Bitcoins created. I want those as those are objectives of mine as well. Um, I think we need to to try to determine exactly what the trade offs are of, of CT and and how auditable we can make that and whether that's something that is something uh, that will be developed in time or discovered in time. I don't know, but it's really honestly, guys, it's a moot point. Um, it's not going to happen. Yeah. Yeah. Even if you went well, even if you had a magical way to make it, I'll just use the too vague term auditable, right? Yeah, then, exactly. Uh, I don't think people care anyway, which is no, really sad because it, it's it's frustrating because I see you spending so much work building out an application that has privacy features and you can hide the graph a bit, right? But like at the end of the day, if you have the amounts that are even denominated or, or like you're, it, it's such an enormous heuristic. I just don't know what you can really do given that is available. It's like, um, like trying to hide, but like when you're already like carrying a GPS tracker in a way, like sure, maybe try and hide under like, like it, it's just kind of absurd to me, I guess. Well, you know, I was thinking about this because I knew this, this was going to be brought up and I was thinking about it really like, well, okay, actually let me re rewind. You said that people won't care. Um, even if they could solve the auditability and, and this and that. Um, not only would do the majority not care, I think they would be actively opposed to it. Um, I think the prospect of private money uh, is too, it's too risky for the entrenched parties at this point. And the entrenched parties are, are, are kind of twofold. We already know about the institutions who have started coming into Bitcoin. Well, they've been coming in since like 2014, right? This isn't new. We've, we've been warning about this for a long time. In fact, Samurai was set up as a response to the institutional money coming in in droves. Um, it's, it's been going on for a while. So, so that's one camp of entrenchment do, that do not want to see privacy on the protocol. The other camp are the number go up guys where privacy actually, in their view, threatens their investment and threatens their number go up. So they don't want it either. So you have these kind of two classes. And that's why I made the, the tweet that was heard around the world, apparently, uh, about you know why I respect the, the Monero community and why it's closer to our heart than the Bitcoin community is, has become. It's because that culture, um, as far as I can see, and I'm not active in the Monero community, uh, I have most of my interaction is through Seth and, and when we chat on, on Twitter and a lot of our Samurai users are also Monero users. So I get to hear how they use um, uh, both chains and, and both tokens. Um, sorry, I kind of forgot my, what I was talking about, <laughs> to be honest with you. <laughs> Lost my train of thought. Um, yeah, you're, you're naming ways why you really think CT would not happen on. Uh, oh, on yeah. Bitcoin. So you, the entrenchment, right? So you have those two camps of entrenchment. Uh, and, and um, it's a shame. But so I was asking myself, well, why the hell am I doing this still? You know, and because I knew that was going to be asked and I had to really think about it. Uh, and, you know, one, I think the most important thing is the demand for our service and our products is growing exponentially. It's been it's been completely unexpected. The rate of growth that we've seen, the amount of people using Whirlpool, the amount of people using the tools that we are building. So obviously there's a demand for it in Bitcoin. Um, if there's a demand for it, people are using Bitcoin. Bitcoin does have a network effect. More people do use Bitcoin than Monero. If there is a need for it, I think that there should be tools available to users. Uh, just because they, and this comes down to one of the criticisms uh, that we get leveled that because some users provide us their XPubs, their public keys that allow us to retrieve their balances, that somehow we shouldn't allow these people to, to engage in coin join. 
right? Because somehow these people are lower class Bitcoin citizens and they've decided that it's in with, within their threat model to share that information with us because they can't run a node. They can't do this. They don't have the bandwidth. But those people shouldn't get on-chain obfuscation techniques. You know, we don't believe in that. We believe that if you're looking for it, you should be able to have it. And we are we built tools that do provide obfuscation. And you're right. It's not it, it's like a bunch of band-aids, you know, because you don't have it on the protocol level. It's a bunch of cat and mouse games. But what we do know is we do know how analysts are observing the Bitcoin blockchain. And we do know how the heuristics that they're using. And we do know they're not as good as they think they are and as they claim they are. And we know how to break those heuristics. And I'm pretty confident that we can move quicker than they can. We're more nimble than they can. So we, I believe we can keep ahead of their heuristics. And I believe that we can keep pushing the game forward like we have been. And I think without being braggy or anything, I think we have pushed the game forward when it comes to mixing in Bitcoin, when it comes to on-chain obfuscation techniques in Bitcoin. We haven't said, oh, we'll just offload this to some side chain quote like liquid or something which is which is bs because you can see exactly how much is going in and how much is coming out it does not matter what the hell confidential transaction is in between who cares right you see in and out it's all you need um you know and we're not pawning it off on some you know theoretical lightning network which you know is is the magical cure for privacy except it isn't at all um you know we're on chain and if no one else is going to do it, I would hate to be the one to leave and say, let me go to a chain that does have default privacy and go do something there. You know, like, why? You guys have you guys have your shit together. You guys have good services. You have good wallets. You know, wh you know, Bitcoin and Bitcoin needs that, too. Um, and I'm also a tenacious guy. So, you know, <laughs> I don't like admitting defeat. A question that comes out of that, I mean, directly to what you just said, like, is there a point at which you'd see, like, we're not seeing enough people using this or we're not seeing enough concern for privacy in Bitcoin that it's just a point that you need to say, like, Bitcoin is just not going to work as a form of digital cash and you need to move somewhere else? Or is it just kind of like a, as long as you're as long as you have people using Samurai, you're just going to keep building no matter what? As long as we have people using it. And as long as we are able to use it in the way we want to use it, if, you know, I, I do think like, so people think I'm excessively bearish on this. No, I think that we're going to have two kind of camps within uh, or multiple camps, but at least two I'm going to focus on and which are the compliance bros, as I call them. And the other guys, the guys like us, the guys who are in the streets. And I think that those two can coexist. Um, like I said, it's a cat and mouse game. Um, if there comes a point where it becomes, where it's just not possible, we can't run our business the way that we've been running it since we established where we don't have a fiat bank account. We don't have, you know, a, a corporate identity anywhere. We're, we're doing what we're doing permissionless. What, you know, if it comes to a point where we can't do that, then yeah, we would pack it in and we would say it failed. I don't see that happening yet. I don't think we're we're anywhere near that point yet. I'm bullish on what we can, what we have planned, and what we can do. And I think as long as users are using it, and not just using it, but obtaining what it is they're setting out to to get, which is some form of of on chain privacy. And I do think we provide that. I think Whirlpool does a, an excellent job of of breaking links. And the other tools that we provide, such as Stonewall and and um, Stowaway, I know they're all a bunch of names that you guys may not be aware of. Um, they do various things and break various heuristics, basically, is, is how I would explain them. Using those in combination with each other, us improving the UX, making it much more easy for users to engage in these functionalities without you know being extremely technical. All that sort of stuff, I think, will increase the overall privacy in Bitcoin. Uh, and just before I finish my rant, we had one block a couple uh, a week ago that had six percent filled with Whirlpool transactions. You know that to us is is huge, and you know we want to see that grow to like ten percent. We want to keep that going, and and to us that's a, a very valuable metric. 
Got it. I'm, I'm going to blow your mind here real quick because I actually do work in compliance for like a cryptocurrency OTC desk. So yeah, I, I noticed that. I assure, I assure you there's, there's a little bit of over uh, dis discrepancy between what you're referring to as compliance pros, I think, but I think most of them fall under the category of just it's it's not Bitcoin people who work in more... compliance actually. Oh, okay. In, in, fact, <laughs> in fact, most people generally have a have a better understanding of what I'm talking about because I've worked with I've worked with a lot of banks before in my in my previous life. And I worked with a lot of compliance officers. Um, no, it's not. It's actually not the professionals. It's it's the uh, I don't even know how to call it. it's the um, sycophants and the the narrative ped peddlers as I called them earlier. Who, who see compliance as a way to enrich themselves and a way to pump their bags. Um, and they see compliance as a way to, um, well, they see privacy on-chain privacy specifically as a threat to compliance, when in fact it doesn't have to be. Yeah, it's, I, I think people, Monero is really the only one that, poses that on-chain problem to most people. And so it's easy when it just dismisses it. It's like, it's, oh, it's just this one thing we can try and ignore. And hopefully they don't have to, they can't. But um, I, I, of course, I'd love to see more people advocating for that specifically. Um, but I guess going back to what you mentioned earlier, though, about uh, the heuristics with regard to, you know, hiding things on chain, um, like I, I have used a lot of these surveillance software before. I believe either you have a direct to fill you, the same entity or very close affiliation with OXT, which I know does their own sort of uh, analysis on chain too. So um, are, are you worried that people will just mark any touching of samurai wallets? Like, you know, funds went in, We even if they can't trace where they go afterwards, if, if ultimately, you know, no one bothers to look at it unless it's a specific, you know, really high profile case where someone does something egregious, let's say. Um, is does it matter if you can't trace it if exchanges largely just be like well it went in so we just don't want to touch it or sure. we're just going to mark it as high risk yeah this is this is what's called the what we call the proximity versus footprint um and as it stands right now we have not seen any evidence of footprint related uh closure so this is a coin join this is a samurai this is a whatever transaction no we haven't seen that yet what we have seen are exchanges shutting down accounts that have coin joined because of proximity to OFAC uh, blacklisted addresses or some other thing. And all of those, none of those have come through, through Whirlpool because the proximity issue with Whirlpool is resolved. There is no proximity. The UTXOs that you have at the end of a Whirlpool cycle have no proximity to the ones that went in. There is no, the, the, the composition of those transactions, the way that we've engineered the system ensures that. The issue came from Wasabi transactions because of the way they engineered their system. They, at that, uh, the issue was a two, two actually two prong issue, a fixed fee address. So they had a, uh, the coordinator takes a, 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 some sort of fee from the user as a civil protection mechanism and as well as a way to pay the coordinator for its services. Um, they had a fixed address that did not change, a, st a static address. So any, ad any user or peer that coin joined paid into that address. And that address was a part of every single mixed transaction. So by proximity, every single UTXO that came out of a mixed transaction was one hop away from a potentially flagged uh, transaction or a potentially flagged address. Uh, the second is the fact that unmixed change in Wasabi continues along within the mix. That's why we call it a peeling chain. And that unmixed change as part of the mix presents a zero hop proximity to the funds. So it's every exchange closure that we've seen that have come from coin joins have come from Wasabi. And it's been because of a proximity issue is our hypothesis because we actively test different exchanges by sending Whirlpool UTXOs directly from Postmix to the exchange, no pro no hopping, no ricochet, which is our tool for adding additional hops of history between um, origin and destination. None of that, just a direct send outside out of the mix to an exchange. We've done Coinbase, we've done Kraken, we've done them all. There's no issue. So our hypothesis is 
as it stands now, it's definitely a proximity issue to, and, and that's only a concern if the mixing client is, well, quite frankly, subpar. So uh, I, I want to dive a little bit into this, and this, this is partially because I'm not especially familiar with the exact way that the mixing process works. Um, so if I was using Samurai Wallet and I was sending my funds in, I, I still need to mix with interactive participants, right? Other people who have opted in to mix, correct? Mm -hmm, so, right. so, so my fear is if I am going to be mixing with, let's, let's just use the example, North Korea, someone from, someone from North Korea is sending their funds there. Of course, there are a bunch of sanctions concerns. So in what way would, was, would, um, would Samurai per make it such that if that initial address was known to be related to a sanctioned entity or country or whatever was identified, how would I not end up with funds that are tainted with, with these coins if I mix with this user? Yep, yeah, sure. Um, so there's two, there's two protections that we built in uh, into Whirlpool, one of which we call a TX0. And the TX0 is kind of our setup transaction. Um, this is where you pay the coordinator fee outside of a mix. Um, this is where the initial UTXO, so let's say it's like a one BTC UTXO gets split into like amounts, um, whether that be 0 0.5, 0 0.05 or 0 0.01, uh, BTC, uh, from there, that transaction is, uh, is our setup transaction TX zero from there. Those new UTXOs are called premix, uh, UTXOs. They haven't been mixed yet, but they are prepared to be mixed. Um, in order to mix, there has to be five participants in a Whirlpool transaction. The number is, is um, completely arbitrary. It can be anything we want. Um, and the, the entropy and the um, linkability scales with it. So there's no, it doesn't matter uh, how many. Um, the second part of the design is that remixing is an essential aspect of Whirlpool. And remixing means you take your initial UTXO that you, has been mixed at least one time and you re-register it and say, please mix this again um, and please mix this again. So in order for a Whirlpool mix to trigger, there has to be a certain number of pre-mix and a certain number of post-mix or remixing UTXOs. Um, the design of that in particular creates a situation where any UTXO can claim origin to the Genesis mix. Okay, so you're basically making so you're making an on-chain connection between the the final output and all of the inputs that have participated. Exactly. Okay. Uh, of the entire anonymity set, backward-looking anonymity set. Uh, so when we track anonymity set, we have a um, concept of forward-looking and backward-looking. This would be the backward-looking anonymity set, um, which is which is well, gosh, it's a really complicated thing. I wrote a I wrote an article on it and I published it on Medium and I would have to pull it up to kind of talk about it again. Um, we can go into it if you want though. The, the, only re the main reason I'm going into it is actually not in relation to the privacy protections it provides. I think that conversation is almost used too much in the space because people are like, oh, this anonymity set number or oh, mm. you know, whatever. I, I agree I, completely with that. I, I actually think it's more useful in terms of the fungibility discussion because what I want to make sure is that a you, I don't want to recommend that people use Samurai if they can't send money to an exchange because it'll be flagged, right? I, I don't want to tell my friends that they need to sit through and do a bunch of paperwork because their funds were on, like connected on chain to a bunch of activities that would probably get their deposit flagged. That that's ultimately a headache that I wouldn't recommend for them. Right. So yeah. I, I'm certainly more interested from the fungibility perspective when looking backwards rather than even the, the privacy directly. Uh, perspective. Yeah, I, I agree completely with that characterization as well. And that's actually one of the reasons why we do not display a metric of a non set at all uh, to users. I, we, we built a tool. It's a Python tool that, you can calculate the forward looking and backward looking and non set as per a snapshot of that trans of the a whirlpool transaction graph in its entirety uh, because you know we believe that it's very easy to just kind of blurt out a number uh, but if you can't reproducibly def if you can't define what that number means and give users a way of reproducibly obtaining that number then it's worthless 
Um, so it, I, I'm with you 100% on that. Um, and I, I, I agree that, and we've identified it as a risk that, of course, that an exchange attitude can change. And they could actually say, you know what? No, this is too risky. All coin joins need to be flagged. Um, I think that we, we need to take advantage of the fact that they're not doing that now. Um, and we need to show that, no, it's not risky for them. There is nothing tainted about a coin join transaction. And in fact, there are, there are um, arguments to be made that coin joins should be utilized by exchanges themselves um, as part of their internal uh, controls to obfuscate you know, certain aspects of their business, uh, if, if that makes sense for their business. Some, some exchanges want to provide full transparency. Other exchanges provide uh, or operate like a normal business that don't open up their, their balance sheet to the world. You know, so, um, and that there's no actual compliance problem with it because you, you can provide the information that you need as an exchange to be compliant um, while still making use of these tools. Uh, so, so in order, you know, in order to take advantage of that, I think we, I, I brought it up a little bit earlier of a 6% um, of whatever block it was being Whirlpool transactions, we need to up that and we need to increase that and we need to normalize the fact that coin join transactions are happening. They're coming into exchanges. They're just normal people. They're not doing anything shady. You know, the, the exchanges want to make money. The exchanges want customers. The exchanges do not want to turn people away. If the system gives them a reason to turn people away, they have to turn them away. It's a proximity thing. If you're one hop away from some banned address, we got to turn you away. If our system says everything's clear, there is nothing to worry about. We have checked our boxes on compliance. We have made our reasonable effort. We contracted with Chainalysis. They said it's okay. Then I see, you know, I, I don't see exchanges going after coin join users. I don't think it makes sense. Yeah, and that's one of those like unique things that Bitcoin brings because it's it has such a big network effect is if you can make it financially disincentivized for exchanges and other people to start banning all coin join transactions or something like that, you can have a pretty powerful tool to push for positive privacy regulation or at least just a lack of negative privacy regulation because exchanges don't want to lose. I mean, if 50% if of Bitcoin going in and out of exchanges is coin joined, they're probably not going to want to lose 50% of their revenue or 50% of their Bitcoin related revenue because it's such a large amount. So, yeah. yeah, precisely. And, and also, look, we built tools. One of the first tools we built, it was the first premium functionality in the wallet. It bootstrapped kind of, you know, getting our first servers and getting all, everything kind of off the ground was Ricochet. And Ricochet is a very simple tool, or at least it was a, when we initialized it, a very simple tool that all it does is we had word on the inside at, that chain analysis was looking five hops back. And what they were doing was saying, okay, if it's five hops back and it's all right, then, you know, nothing, no red flags and you're good. Uh, and they weren't checking more than that. And this, again, remember the time was about 2000. 15 or 16, I, I want to say. Yeah, things okay. were simpler back then. <laughs> things were simpler back then. The tools were different. Absolutely right. Um, and, and concepts were different. Uh, so we said, okay, well, let's just create a tool that will add five additional hops of history from, from a, a zero point. Um, and then that later evolved into a tool that can stagger out across multiple blocks, different transactions uh, that, that trigger into one one um, destination eventually. So instead of being sequentially one, two, three, four, five, it's, you know, in block number one, it's this, and block 17, it's this, it's block 18, it's this, um, this part of the transaction, and there's no fingerprint to it on chain, right? So it becomes way more difficult to, to say that this is a ricochet transaction. This has a, this ha you know, we, we're not gonna allow this. It just becomes lost in the noise. Um, that feature is used a lot, um, I think, primarily with like local Bitcoin.com traders. Uh, I don't know why I, I, I don't use it that, that service anymore, but they use it a lot when sending to sending there. So maybe they have kind of a strict policy on something. I'm not sure. Um, if that became a problem, those types of tools, again, I think we would be able to move quicker than the chain analysis um, analysts 
in terms of coming up with heuristics and deploying them across their, um, you know, their client base. Uh, they, they have strong, stronger tools than we have because they share data. Exchanges who sign up to chain analysis share data with, with each other um, generally as part of the chain analysis uh, agreements that they sign. They're just not allowed to talk about it due to NDA. Um, so they have, you know, a lot of asymmetry, uh, information asymmetry that, that we don't, we aren't privy to. We can only look at on-chain stuff and we can only kind of determine what's going on on-chain. Um, the second point to, to what you said, Seth, is, you know, once you're in the exchange for the most part, and it's only going to get like the, even more so as time goes on, you're, you're clocked. They got you. They, they know who you are. You know, they got your KYC information. You're not, you're not hiding from anyone. And now with like the, the, the new rules coming in from FATF, the travel rule and stuff, wherever you're sending, they're going to be sharing that information. The other exchange is going to know. Uh, so I don't think they care about coin joints coming in, to be honest with you, as long as they can check their tick box to say, you know, the, the source of these funds is not risky. Uh, as long as they can make that that check mark, I think, you know, there's no real risk of them banning coin joint transactions. Yeah, and I think that that's one of the things I can't remember who said it. Someone else brought it up before, and I'm definitely plagiarizing it. But they were talking about how the whole idea of companies like Chainalysis existing only exists because of the transparency in Bitcoin, and because there's this gap where, hey, we can look at the provenance of funds, and we can do this tracing to easily show you, like, is this a bad person or is this a good person? Obviously, absolutely. In quotes, yeah. but doing that kind of that kind of work. So, tools like Samurai go a long way to making that less useful, and hopefully, enough people will use it to to just break that heuristic entirely. So they can't just say coin join bad, but they have to say maybe we can trace some of these, or maybe we can do very targeted tracing due to law enforcement or yeah, or like good old-fashioned kind of but... police work, you know, yeah. do a <laughs> yeah. goddamn investigation, for God's sake, you know? It's not like a blanket thing that every single person needs to be subjected to, but that's yeah. just the way things are, you know? how That's how, how it is in Bitcoin. It is open, and and it's not, you know, it's, it's not just a Bitcoin problem. It's a cultural problem uh, at a wider level. KYC oh. is, is, you know, what... Uh, was it 25 years old, really, in the, in the 25, 30 years old in the way that we have it now in terms of how subversive and creeping it is? It's not, you know, it's not something that goes back in time through our history. Uh, this is a new concept, and it's been completely accepted and completely digested, and it will only, it will only get stronger. Uh, more, uh, more rules and more information will be taken, and and, you know, that's just the reality of things in the world. It's not a Bitcoin problem, but Bitcoin enables it because it is a public ledger. And where you have an opportunity to make money, you will have people going to make money and you have a captured market, right? If, you're, if you by law are required to check, uh, tick these checkboxes, you need a company who will, you know, allow you to do that. And that company has a protected business. They have a guaranteed revenue stream. You know, it, of course they're going to do it. Yeah, and yet there's a chance, and that's why I'm so excited about this space, because of the chance that we can build tools using technology to actually break free of that system. And even, like to me, I'm not as paranoid about KYC. I would always say to avoid it where possible. Like I, I try to, I would always advise that. But if we build good enough tools so that when we go out of the exchange and we pull away from that, their tracing stops, I don't have nearly as much of a problem with this kind of KYC AML regulations for those entities as long as we have the tools to make it very easy for everyone to gain anonymity once they move off of that system if we don't have that like if everyone just uses bitcoin in the by default way with wallets yeah. that provide no privacy then it's terrifying and it's really a it's it is a it's a capitalism hellscape. dream yeah it's, 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 it's absolute it's hellscape yes no i yeah, i agree um yeah there's there's really nothing i can add to that other than you're absolutely right that's why i got into this um, you know, as a way to defeat the system. I mean, I, I, I disagree a bit on, on the, the impact of KYC. Uh, that's a record that can never really be removed. I know it's just like, what, seven years or whatever they're supposed to keep it, but let's be honest, that record exists forever. And uh, I think that, look, we, we've seen just 2020 alone, right? The, what's gone on in terms of Corona and how governments have responded and how they've been able to respond, whether you agree or disagree with the response, 
just the fact that they've been able to shut down businesses, they've been able to shut down the world economy, essentially, uh, at the, with the stroke of a pen by fiat. I think anyone thinking that that um, some sort of uh, you know black swan event, which turns a government hostile towards Bitcoin um, or any crypto, if there's a KYC record, you know that's a huge threat to you. You become a targeted person. You had this. Where did it go? And you know the Bitcoiners have the oh it is a, a, a it's sunk in a boat or some some sort of bullshit like that. That's not going to work. Have that, we have that too. It's it's yeah, it's, it's, it's a running work. joke. Though. Right. Well, exactly. It, it's a joke. It's it's kind of a meme. But it, you should not believe that. You cannot rely on that um, at all. You know, any lawyer will tell you that you, you better if you're going to rely on that. Let's see your insurance claims. Let's see the proof of the boat purchase or rental. Let's you know, you better be able to back that claim up, buddy. Otherwise, that's perjury. And you just made yourself really, <laughs> a really big problem. You know, so to me, KYC is a huge threat. I really I really try to get people to avoid it. A lot of the mm -hmm. people, you're absolutely right. They come into the space. It's It's almost unavoidable at this point, to be honest with you. Uh, it, you have to work pretty hard to get to get non KYC coins. You either have to earn it, mine it, or or kind of figure out BISC or something like that. You know, it's it's a difficult kind of thing to do. A lot of the people in our community, uh, I've noticed, and I was just talking about this today in our Telegram group. Um, once they realize the implications of KYC and what it what it really means for them, they prefer to sell back their coins to the same source that they they acquired them and break that record in that way to say hey i did acquire them from at, at this time from this source and now i'm selling them at this time to this source uh and they'll take the tax implication as a cost of learning and they may or may not acquire their cryptocurrency and other means now that they are more familiar with ways of achieving that so I think that's a success. If, if we can get our community, uh, at least some of our community, the more hardcore guys to understand that and do that, I think that is a successful thing. And, and, and I don't think that scales, but, but again, it's, there's going to be that fracture and there's going to be those two kind of camps. And I think as long as we can keep our camp kind of alive, and again, it's, it's kind of a marketing thing, but I truly mean it. It is the streets, the Bitcoin for the streets, as long as we can keep that in the gutter kind of, people like us will be okay as long as we have some tools to at our disposal will be okay and and i'm not one of these people that will never use any other coin that's not what i'm about i think i see monero as a tool in the tool belt and i know a lot of our guys use monero uh in conjunction with whirlpool for various reasons uh so it's a tool man and uh, you know it, it's, a, it's a tool to get you to an objective Very cool. Um, do you do you think that? Um, I, I guess we can talk about fees a little bit. So I guess, to what extent are you worried that fees will make coin join techniques really difficult for users and help and be a roadblock for you know samurai and other privacy features adoption with Bitcoin? Um, I think it's a really yeah. I mean, it impacts it for sure. Um, high network fees make coin joins considerably more expensive. Um, doesn't enrich the coordinator, doesn't enrich us. It basically enriches the miners. Um, so it's not like we're fleecing anyone. It just makes it, uh, the whole process more expensive. Um, and when we've seen spikes on the Bitcoin network, um, recently we've seen some spikes. It's nothing like you know the, the previous fee events that we saw in previous years, but we've seen some spikes, uh, 200 sat fees, this or that. People do coin join less initially. Um, first couple days of a, of a fee spike, we will see less coin joins while people hold back and wait it out to see if the mempool is going to clear, to see if this is sustained to, to whatever. Uh, but then it picks back up once it becomes a, a the, the normal quote unquote fee, uh, which usually takes about four days for people to get used to it. They say, okay, fees are now a hundred sats. Oh, God damn. Uh, then they start war pulling again. They start coin joining again. Um, you know, the, because we have three different pools, uh, uh, denominations, so you can have a denomination of 0.5 BTC or 0.05 BTC or 0.01 BTC, um, you kind of have a little bit of control of how many UTXOs get created, so you can minimize the amount of minor fee 
uh, impact. Uh, so for example, you wouldn't mix one Bitcoin in the 0.01 pool because that would create an enormous amount of UTXOs that would need to be mixed. You would maybe do it in the 0.5 pool or the 0.5 pool, um, which would 0.5 pool would create like, you know, two UTXOs that need to be mixed, which is a manageable fee rate. Um, I think so, it is it, it is, a, is a threat, but I do think that there may be um, ways to mitigate against it. Um, I know Seth did some tests on this. Uh, like if I have a specific output, suppose it's, you know, a, a, a 0 0.05 adequately sized UTXO, what would be the approximate time and cost that it would, like I should expect to have for a, not like a, not an insane level of, of privacy, but like let's, let's call it a reasonable level of privacy that's provided in Samurai. You take the, whatever default option and, and how yeah, sure. expensive. So and, what was the size of your UTXO? I'm sorry. Uh, it's a 0. 0.5 UTXO. Yeah, the, well, I'm just finding whatever exact amount that fit your denomination. I think mine was a 0. 0.25, for example. I think that's roughly what okay, I a put 0. in, 0. in my or something. like right. test that I detailed out. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That, which was great, by the way. Thank you for that. Yeah. Um, so for a 0. 0.25 uh, BTC UTXO, I probably would choose the 05 pool um, or the 01 pool. It's really you know depending on what the fees were. If it was a low fee day, I would choose the 01 <laughs> pool maybe. Um, We've charged a flat fee, so so you basically are paying based on which pool you choose. If you're paying, if you're choosing the 0.5 pool, the fee is 0 0.025. If you're paying, if you're choosing the 0 0.05 pool, 0 0.05 pool, the uh, the fee is 0 0.0025. I think I got that right. And if you're paying, if you're doing the 0 0.01 pool, it's 0 0.0005. So it's 5% of the denomination of the pool. It's not 5% of what you're putting in. It's a flat fee. Uh, so it's, it's a very economical uh, fee to the coordinator. It could get expensive if you have multiple, if you have a huge amount of UTX that was to mix in terms of miners fees. But in terms of the coordinator, it's a very, very fee, uh, fair structure. And there's two reasons why we did this. And it's important to understand because it, 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 it goes back to something I said earlier, which is the importance of remixing. Uh, what we wanted to do was encourage users to stick around and keep mixing their, their UTXOs, engage in new cycles. And we did not believe by making them pay for each cycle that they would do it. So remixing is free. Once you pay that one fee of 5% of the denomination of the pool you choose, then you're in and you can continuously mix. So in your example, um, you choose the 0, 0.5 pool, um, you pay 0, 0, uh, 0.025 and 0, 0, 0, 0.0025. And um, the first mix is generally really quick. You just need to wait for a confirmation. Um, if blocks are flowing, you'll get that confirmation within like 10 minutes, generally. And as soon as that gets confirmed, you pretty much will be selected immediately um, for a mix. You'll, you, you'll essentially trigger a mix. Um, and that will go through all of those premix UTXOs. So I, I explained the TX0 concept earlier. So those premix UTXOs will all be selected. They'll all be mixed pretty much immediately. As soon as that's done through the queue, they'll be re-registered as you know available to be uh, considered as liquidity. Say, hey, if there's a new premix coming in, I'm available to be a part of this mix for free. Um, those are randomized. We can't tell you exactly how long that's going to take. What we can say is keep the client running. Um, the more UTXOs you have, the, the more uh, likely you are to be selected. Uh, actually, I don't think that's true anymore. That was, that was an earlier design. Uh, I would have to check on that. Um, Keep the client running. We we built out the infrastructure to make a, make it so it's very easy to run in command line as a daemon um, uh, on a Raspberry Pi, uh, wherever the hell you want to run this as a service. You can keep it continuously mixing forever or as a desktop GUI. Um, you can do that or on mobile. Uh, keep the app open. Mobile is a little tricky and, the, you know, the app is still alpha. There's still plenty of stuff we can do to make things better. Um, Android has a lot of limitations on the way that um, background services work now. So you have to be kind of keeping the app open all the time and messing around with it so it doesn't time out. Uh, all of those things can, can uh, 
damage your experience in terms of how quickly things can get moving um, on mobile. But for remixing, I always suggest desktop. And you know, I, I've seen personally, I've been able to mix, you know, a Bitcoin, two Bitcoins, and get remixes on the same day, multiple remixes. And I think once you're at two or three mix uh, remixes the privacy benefits are, are huge already. And, and those can be calculated. Uh, once you, the first mix, it, it, it breaks the deterministic links. The second mix, it's, it's great. You know, uh, there really is, everything's very confused now. Uh, and anything other than that, I mean, just keeps building on and, and starts to get crazy levels of, of, again, anonymity set in terms of backwards looking um, and forward looking. Thanks for that rundown. Okay. So yeah, you can run down, but so, so it sounds like it takes several, like a day or, or several days to mix that. Well, again, we, we encourage people to mix it constantly. Uh, mm -hmm. In fact, we say mix it until it's time to spend. And then when you spend, spend directly from post mix. And then the yeah. change you get back, mix that. Um, you know, there's no reason for you not to spend unmixed coins. Make every spend a coin join. There's, there's absolutely zero reason to do it. Now, some people want to move their, their UTXOs into cold storage. Of course, that makes sense. You don't want to, you don't want to keep a huge amount of Bitcoin, you know, on a, on a, um, a device like, a that can be signed that with the private keys are hot. Um, and, and different people manage that in different ways. You know, I'm, I'm not going to tell people how to do that. I know people are mixing large amounts of Bitcoin in, in, in Whirlpool. Um, and they obviously feel that it's, it's safe enough to do so. That's all your own personal thing. Um, we need to manage one of the risks or a challenges I should say is, is managing how people exit the mixer and how they exit post mix, how they send to cold storage. Um, all of those things have the possibility of, of severely damaging the, the benefits that you obtained through the coin join process. It's easy to screw it up. And that's another benefit of, of what you guys have done on Monero in your community is it's less easy to screw things up because you have a blanket protection. Uh, so it becomes on our end an education problem, uh, a problem with, with, again, crappy wallets that allow you to spend all, for God's sake, of your coin joined transaction, uh, UTXOs. I mean, come on. And, and you got people doing it. I mean, there's a meme in our community uh, where some guy from, from Wasabi came over and was basically, it, the meme is, with max button, I am safe and fast. He literally typed this, and the max button is the send all button, you know, which they have in the, in the wallet, uh, which connects every single mixed UTXO together. <laughs> and then all you have to do is go uh, to the, the entry point and look for the, t, uh, the, yeah. the um, UTXO that matches. Yeah, that's not I mean, work. it's trivial. Uh, we make it difficult. We can't. It's very difficult for you to spend your entire postmix balance in Samurai. When you do go to spend, we have a tool, uh, a spend tool that's on by default if it's possible to trigger called Stonewall, um, which essentially creates either um, a fake coin join transaction uh, where it's you cannot tell the difference between whether it's a real coin join transaction or a fake coin trans uh, multiple peers or a single peer. Um, we have another type of post-mix transaction that breaks a different type of heuristic. So we give users the options of exiting the mixer um, in different, uh, you know, different options for different needs. And we encourage them to use those, but it's an education thing. We have to teach them to use them and we have to drill it into them and we have to make the same defaults in the wallet to don't allow them to do stupid things that really, you know, from a user's perspective, aren't stupid, right? Like they want to send the whole amount. And in normal life, okay, if you want to spend the nor send send the whole amount, you send the whole amount. You don't send out little bits at a time, right? Like it's not a concept that is natural. Uh, they have to they have to learn it. They have to understand it. And unless you're you know you're really into it, or you're you know you're kind of paranoid and worried, you don't you don't know to ask those types of questions. Yeah, I think that's um, that's something that I've struggled with with Bitcoin in general is even as someone who's pretty technical and very privacy conscious post mix spending is really terrifying for me and like that's a big part of why I struggle with actually like using Bitcoin to pay for things 
And one reason why I tend towards Monero, because there's a lot less ways to shoot myself in the foot using Monero natively. Um, and I think you all have done a great job of pulling away and hiding and making it much more difficult to do the major mistakes with post-mix spending in general. Um, but I'm curious if you see kind of like a, a path forward to continue just making users not point their own gun at their own feet. Like that's kind of like a, a default thing you have to do in any kind of privacy tool. So I'm yep. curious if you have kind of a path forward for how you'll continue to make it simpler for users yes. to just spend without worrying every time. Like, am I combining UTXOs? Like, am I using the right one? Am I absolutely like, all that? Yeah, absolutely. We 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 do, and it's a two. Uh, it's a couple prongs to that one. Uh, again, like I said, it's education and and the UI and UX. We have to improve things and explain things better. You know, it's a very you know it's it's rough around the edges. It's an alpha product. Uh, but the second most important thing is, is a, um, we're working on an updated coin, uh, coin selection algorithm, uh, which basically takes all the stuff that we've done to this point, which is, has been iterative and building on each other uh, to the point where we're at now, where we have Whirlpool, uh, the coin join and, and all the other stuff. And they're still their own little fiefdoms. You know, you still have they're not interconnected. They don't share history with each other. The wallet doesn't know that this UTXO is a, it was the product of a stone wall and this UTXO is a product of a, uh, a Cahoots transaction and what the hop before it, what that was all about. The wallet doesn't know any of that stuff. It's kind of blind and dumb to it. Um, one of the, the uh, things we're working on is that this coin selection algorithm or, or it's more broad than that but we call that solomon which does have memory and does, does have history and it has a concept of what you've been doing with this particular utxo where it's been and doesn't rely on the user to create labels and doesn't require the user to create tags and anything like that it auto automatically is able to to do that for them and automatically able to say um, no, we're not going to use this UTXO in this transaction because of reason X, Y, Z. Um, that is an, an active development, and I think it's going to be a huge, um, you know, a huge, a huge push in that direction of sane defaults and giving users an insight into kind of how the actual UTXO uh, EO model works and and what the implications of it are. If we can, if we can pull it off in a visual way where it's just you know, uh, very easy to grasp. It will help them visualize this thing without them actually needing to do anything uh, specific to obtain that level. Uh, so we're very excited about about that. And then we have other uh, other aspects of the wallet. Like for example, we have an account. Uh, we use accounts a lot within the HD structure um, for segregating funds. So for example, the account zero of the wallet, the deposit section of the wallet is a completely segregated account from the premix area UTXOs, which is completely segregated from the postmixed area UTXOs. And none of the UTXOs can commingle with each other. It's just not possible unless you use a modified client or, you know, take your seat and, and really, you really have to work for it, right? It's just not something that you can do easily. Um, well, we've introduced another one called Bad Bank, and Bad Bank is is where the UTXOs, for example, the the change of a TX0 into Whirlpool, the toxic change that we call it. This is connected without question to the premix activity. It's not part of the postmix activity. It's not part of the premix. It, 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 it it's in the account zero section right now. We're moving that out into the um, Bad Bank section and. These, these UTXOs can be really interesting because um, we can do a lot of things with them to break assumptions. Because uh, you have an assumption of this is owned by of a certain party, for example, if they come from a KYC source and they've gone into Whirlpool. Uh, we, could, we could prioritize selection of those particular UTXOs and bad bank um, for what we call a, a stowaway transaction, which is uh, two, two participants, uh, you and me, swap UTXOs to create a transaction that appears to be a quote unquote simple transaction. So as many inputs as required and two outputs, which would presumably be destination and change. Um, and in fact, again, the, the amount is distorted. You don't know the true amount sent on the blockchain because through a communication between two peers, you have actually swapped UTXOs in a, in a matter that 
um, isn't apparent on chain. Um, and that's similar to PayJoin? Is it the same it, thing? Just it a predates name, PayJoin. Or it... Yeah, okay. it, it okay. predates PayJoin. PayJoin came a little bit after it, but it's the same concept, same exact concept, yeah. in fact. I don't know if PayJoin is able to obfuscate the amounts uh, or not that are sent. Uh, I don't know if they implemented that part of it. Um, I don't remember, but it's exactly, yeah, it's it's essentially a PayJoin. Um, thank you for saying that. It's a way easier explanation. Uh, <laughs> Uh, but you uh, using the toxic, quote unquote, toxic change as inputs to these types of transactions are really are really kind of it's nebulous because it, it you cannot. Um, well, it really breaks a heuristic there because you think you really think one thing as a as an analyst, right? You have a assertion that this UTXO uh, is the is owned by person A. Uh, and they went into coin uh, into a coin join, and they went back out. Uh, here's a change, and then suddenly this change is used in what appears to be a very simple transaction, which should which should indicate that it's the same user, but it's not at all. It's a completely different user, um, and what that creates is this weird. If you look at it in the transaction graph, it creates this weird bubble. You know, this weird giant uh, yarn ball of the samurai cluster. And when you look at that, because or, or the Samurai and PayJoin, uh, which I guess other wallets have started to implement these things, but I call it the Samurai cluster because we were the only one for so long. Um, this yarn ball where you just don't know. You can't, you can't, as an analyst, go into that yarn ball and be sure of anything. Your assumptions are broken. Um, and, and that's you know, a possible risk, again, on the checkmark compliance side. But I don't think so. It hasn't it hasn't manifested that way yet. And again, it's a network effect thing. The larger that yarn ball becomes, the more you know, the more that you do actually have to contend with it. Yeah, for sure. And I, yeah, I'm thankful that y'all are pushing more and more to do things automatically for the user because education is definitely important. But the vast majority of people, at least that I know, even if there's clear and well thought out education, if there's an easy way to do the wrong thing. Or if it's easier or cheaper to do the wrong thing, they'll just do the wrong thing. Yeah, so that's, what, that's, what, that's what we've noticed. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's a big part yeah. where I think it will be valuable in Samurai Wallet, and I mean that's a big reason why Monero has chosen to make those things consensus level changes rather than just soft fork or opt-in features, because we know users are going to shoot themselves in the foot if they can. So we want to take away as much of that possibility as possible. Yeah, like yeah. in the in the past, like uh, you used to be able to send Monero transactions effectively without a ring signature. I mean, technically it was a ring signature, but there were no decoys in the transaction. And even though the default was configured a certain way that users should do that, and we even removed functionality from the main wallets for you to be able to do that, but it was not a consensus change. People still did it pretty consistently. So it uh, it's good to see yeah. doing everything like if you're if you're worrying about education it's too late like it well really that's right is. I mean, it doesn't scale at all you know i, no, I think it, it, i think it's a good thing to educate because there are going to be people that that will want to learn and will want to know and in fact won't actually want to use the product unless they understand what's going on but there are a very small subset of people um so it doesn't scale at all you have to do same defaults um and you have to you have to make it uh almost impossible for the user to to shoot themselves in the foot with whatever methods you you can. And again, we're not protocol developers, we're app developers. So we can only focus on the application layer and the application level and, you know, I don't know, sacrifice a lamb and pray to the gods that, that <laughs> something changes. Um, but again, I don't I don't see that that happening. You're gonna be doing a lot of sacrificing every year. Yeah. Um, so um, Seth, did you have anything else on the transaction structure topics or do you wanna move on to like the, okay. So, uh, I think uh, one thing that we want to know in the Monero community, like, what is uh, like, what do you think Monero does well? What do you think Monero can do better? What advice do you have for the Monero community based off what you see on the, you know, this other world over here in the Bitcoin community? Sometimes it seems separate. <laughs> oh, it, it feels very separate, actually, um, from from what I can see. Uh, so, our my my biggest uh, view into Monero is through the darknet markets. Um, I view the darknet markets as a bellwether. 
um, and the acceptance of Monero has been on the rise uh, for some time. And not only the acceptance, but the encouragement. And the, in some cases, uh, I, I'm not sure if the market is still around, but in some cases, the requirement to, to use Monero. The gains made in the dark net market should scare the shit out of Bitcoiners. Because whether they uh, are a part of that world or not, whether they agree with that type of thing or not, that is what Bitcoin is meant to satisfy. That type of uncensorable commerce, you know, whether it be legal or illegal, it doesn't matter. It's permissionless. Um, and it's, you know, it's up to compliance guys like, like yourself, professionals to counter that within your professional lives and within the exchanges. But if it can't be done on Bitcoin and it's being taken by by another coin, then Bitcoiners should be aware of that. Um, and they should they should really, really ask themselves, well, why and why is not Lightning Network, you know, being deployed on on darknet markets why aren't they why aren't darknet markets asking for liquid btc why oh, you know like really just, these are just hard questions that now oh right these are i mean you guys know but a lot of these guys a lot of these people believe that lightning network is a private solution um and it's not you know um so and and, and i don't even have to get into the technicals of it the, the the results speak for themselves there is no there is no one asking for that um, in those communities, so so we keep an eye on the on the on the dark markets. We keep an eye on on um, on uh, dread and and those areas in particular. See what the sentiment is. See what people are talking about and 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 how they're using these these uh, coins. Um, my advice is, culture really really matters, and and it's easy to be to be led astray and it's easy to kind of be taken by price movements and, and the promises of, um, you know, just do this a little bit and the trade off is, is worth it because more people get to have it and mass adoption and beware of mass adoption. That's a, I will be clear of, uh, on that. Do not seek Mac mass adoption. Um, uh, my my co-founder said it to me, I believe, and his quote was, "You know, mass adoption is the poison pill. Uh, as soon as you get to that point, you kind of lost the battle." And uh, you guys are a little bit different because you have again that privacy on the protocol layer, which does provide a little bit of protection there. But culture matters; things can change, developments can change, code can change quickly. Um, Beware of, of cults of personality. Beware of um, um, regulatory capture. You let don't let the <laughs> the wolf into the hen house. Um, that sort of thing, because uh, that's what I've seen happen on Bitcoin since 2013, um, accelerating in the last few years. And it's it's something that can be managed, I think, and it's something that requires a fight. But I would hate to see that happen in the Monero community as well. Yeah, a couple of quick comments on that. Um, I think using darknet markets as a research angle is really valuable because especially for any kind of technological tool for privacy, you're always going to see it adopted first by people at the fringe and people who feel the need for privacy most clearly. I think everyone needs it, but a lot of people don't realize it. So it's definitely an interesting research angle to keep an eye on see like how do these people who obviously feel the need for privacy view these tools? And if you see Bitcoin losing adoption there, yeah, I think you're seeing that the people who feel the need for privacy feel that privacy isn't the right, or that that Bitcoin is not the right tool for for those things, which is is definitely an interesting angle. And I think whatever you think about darknet markets or illegal use of funds, like uh, whatever you think of that, it's a good research angle to just keep on top of and to keep an eye out for to see how that how that goes. So I think it is interesting to watch what y'all put out about that and. Um, just a couple other sources I followed. Yeah, we're not condoning or, or anything like that. We yeah. we just we're just watching. You know, we're yeah. looking and we're seeing what the what the chatter on the streets is basically. Yeah, exactly. And um, on the second point, just on mass adoption, that's one that I don't. 
I don't know. Like, I definitely am hoping for mass adoption. And that's one of the reasons why I'm so excited for a layer one protocol that implements all of these things by default, like Monero. Um, and that's one angle where I think the mass adoption can be good and doesn't necessarily take away from the the things that we're building. I think if it happens quickly, it can be very dangerous. And I think that may be part of what's happened to Bitcoin is it gained adoption as a speculative asset very quickly instead of actually as digital cash or something that builds a circular economy. Um, so I'm definitely hopeful that that doesn't happen with Monero. Um, and I think we've tried to go to pretty good lengths to keep like price talk out of most channels and keep them in their own place. If you're a trader, you can talk about things in their places for that, but go in your that's not corner. the reason we're here. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Go in your little corner. Um, yeah, but I that's, like, that's what I mean by culture. Uh, yeah. And and you want to you want to hold on to that. And 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 my point is, as you grow, especially exponentially, that becomes difficult to to contain. I mean, I've been a part of subcultures and 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 internet communities for since I was like 12, 13 years old when I got my first computer. Um, you know, a little younger than that. And and the same story. Every, anyone who's been a part of an IRC channel knows the story. You know, the you know, IRC channel is great, then flooding, you know, all these new people come in and IRC channel becomes a shithole. And then you have to create a new IRC channel and then recreate the whole process over again. Or if any of you guys remember Live Journal, uh, that was a whole subculture of people uh, back in like 07, I believe, 06. And communities thrived and crumbled uh over the over the course of their of their lifetimes and and it all it all comes down to the wrong the uh, an influx of people that don't share the common culture of the of the founders or the original group and it can be managed of course you're absolutely right and time and amount and and uh um you know yeah the the the, the amount of people over time makes a difference, right? If you have an immediate influx of people, and like you said, uh, they're all there to make some make some money, you know, where this thing is on a tear and we're just gonna, you know, 10, 20, 30 X or so, whatever. Uh, yeah, you're gonna have a big culture problem. Uh, generally, those people shake out though, eventually, uh, those types of trading types. Um, but it's still, I, I, I still see it as a risk. And that's why I do say that, culture, uh, that um, uh, mass adoption is dangerous. Uh, it, if it's going to happen, it's going to happen, but it doesn't need to be sought out. Uh, and you need to focus on creating the 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 value proposition and creating it ironclad. And and that's the thing with Bitcoin. We didn't have time uh, to do it. Um, it did. It stopped being digital cash in terms of actual. You know, again, it's not coffee money. That's not a, a, you know the little big block. I don't want to get into that whole thing. I'm talking digital uncensorable cash and yeah you know it won't we won't be able to get to that point where it's a, at a protocol thing because of the influx of institutions and 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 people of a different mindset a, a larger different mindset of that and it's hard to manage man it's a hard thing to, to deal with and i think really it's been admirable that you have in the monero community been able to keep your culture for such a long time and 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 foster it and grow it and and i see intersects with with how you've done that and how we within our community do that as well within the samurai community itself not the broader bitcoin community um the samurai community you know uh, i see it as a very different type of bitcoiner uh, I, I i see them as a bitcoiner who are not dogmatic they're not looking to score points. They're not looking to virtue signal or to to pose. They're looking to achieve uh, an outcome, and and samurai is is one again one tool in their tool belt to achieve that outcome, and it's why we have a lot of crossover usage between between Monero is because it's just another tool. Um, yeah, and that's I, yeah, yeah, and I think that. Monero's benefited in a big way from Bitcoin being kind of its big brother and being something that's taken a lot of the speculation and other interest in front of it. So Monero's had a lot more time to just keep iterating on a fundamental level and keep this close-knit community that's not small. I mean, it's big compared Very, to most yeah. communities and it's growing, but one that has so far shared a, a pretty consistent ethos and has allowed us to really build and iterate over the years that Monero's been around. And a lot of the 
influx of people who are just looking for number go up or things like that have stayed in Bitcoin specifically and other ones too. But that's helped Monero have more time to iterate without that sudden rush of speculative adoption or other types of adoption, which has definitely been a good thing for Monero and something I'm thankful for Bitcoin taking. And I'm hopeful that Bitcoin can still push through that though to become what it could be. Because I think as a, as a technological tool, it has so much potential. And with the network effects it has, if things like Samurai Wallet can take over, or in, if in my dream world, layer one changes for privacy happen, I think it could be a, a massive force for good in the world. I don't, personally, I'm not sure if those things will actually happen. I love what y'all are doing with Samurai and I'm hopeful that adoption continues to take off. Um, but yeah, it's definitely, it's a, it's a tricky place to be in for sure yeah. because of the sudden influx of people that have come in over the last decade into Bitcoin. I mean, I would, I would love that too. Uh, I, I'll, I'll be happy with, with people uh, achieving the outcomes that they come for in Samurai. Um, even if it's a small number of people, uh, which, you know, I think I never expected to have this many users or to be, to be, I mean, we, I have a team now that work on Samurai pretty much full time of about seven in total, including customer support, eight, maybe a little bit more now, uh, including myself and my co-founder. So, I mean, I never, and you know, the amount of investment we've taken has been minimal, uh, really, really small from individual people, uh, who support us basically. Um, I, I'd never imagined that this would turn into such a, such a well-used and popular product. I never imagined that there was this much demand for it. I kind of thought that it was, it was more niche. Uh, so if that continues then I, I feel really good about what we're doing and I, and I think that, um, overall it's, it's, it's a net benefit, uh, benefit to these people. Uh, who are using our products and and as long as they're getting what they know that what we're telling them and, and we're not misleading anyone we are so transparent about what you are achieving when you use our tools you know we make it we try to make it as clear as day and 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 it's hard sometimes it's hard to explain to people um but we go through this all the time on telegram Seth, i think you're in, in some of the telegram rooms where you were at some point you probably saw it you know it, it's a constant influx of people constant stream of really kind of the same types of questions uh, and and correcting misconceptions about what people think they're getting versus what they are getting. Um, and I think as long as as we're honest and upfront and people understand what they're getting um, and we can improve and, and keep getting better and new tools and new outcomes that are even even more powerful than previous ones, uh, I think it's it's a great thing. And I'm, I'm very happy to be be working on this uh, and been, been able to work on this uh, for for a little over five years now. For sure. That's something I really appreciate about y'all too. And it was something that jumped out at me in the um, last Medium article. I guess it's by OXT, not directly by y'all, but talking about just engineering practice and how important it is to communicate effectively information about the limitations. And I think that's something that Monero's prided itself on too, that we're Breaking very Monero. transparent. <laughs> exactly. Like we, we go through the trouble to explain like, this is not a perfect tool. Like there are gaps. There is it's nuance so all of those things. And and y'all doing the same thing is one of the reasons why I've really yeah, that, gained that a alone, lot of respect. That alone, yeah. is, that alone is probably the best identifier of whether a community is mature or not is if they are able to put out easy resources about why their system sucks, <laughs> right? Yeah, you What's have wrong to know the it? limitations, right? You have to. Um, absolutely. I, I really appreciate that. You know, that, that whole... Honestly, that whole ordeal, that whole saga uh, was so just so disappointing. Um, I assume you read the original disclosures that we put out. Um, we felt, uh, you know, we tried to do things privately at first. They didn't want they didn't want to do that. So we made it public. Uh, we tried our, our utmost to pre present the information in a, in a digestible way for regular users and also provide a more detailed look at the disclosure um, for more technical minded users. Uh, we, we presented all the flaws in our attack, how, how our attack could be mitigated, uh, sources of randomness that, this, that we don't know, uh, all of this. But, but really in my head, I was like, I mean, it's a coin join coordinator. Coin selection is deterministic. Obviously that's a fuck up. Let's, let, let's get it fixed. And everyone, you know, no one's going to argue this point, right? Like you don't want deterministic pretty much anything in a, in a, in a coin join, um, you know, let alone coin selection. No, 
that was not the response. The response was, this is blackmail. This is, you know, well, well, you saw what all the responses are because we put a whole list of them together. But this, you know, this was a whole thing that went over the course of a week. And to me, it's just so anti, well, it shows immaturity. You say, you, uh, you use the word mature. It shows how mature community is if they're able to put out research and, and distill their information about their system and the flaws and the weaknesses and this and that. Well, if you're unable to do that, it shows immaturity. Uh, and and the users and the developers of the of the software showed immense immaturity, uh, uh, unable to even comprehend that this is a this is an issue. This is a serious issue, and it should be fixed. And the res the the response instead was a plastering campaign on Twitter about how evil and mean Samurai Wallet is, and how we do all these terrible things like collect your X pubs and 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 whatnot instead of hey, let's fix this thing. Let's fix the fact that coin selection is deterministic. Yeah, it's one of those, it's one of those tricky things where I, I worry too, when, like if strong research comes out showing some flaw in Monero that either we knew about and didn't know the lengths of or something like that, it's tricky when there's something you're deeply invested in and that you deeply, I don't know if trust is the right word, but that you, you like deeply think that it provides something when you're told that it doesn't, it's hard to accept that truth and figure out, okay, instead of either throwing it away or just saying, no, there's no problem, like accepting the flaw and trying to fix it, that really does take maturity and it's difficult. And I, I don't hard. even know how many people in the Monero community would do that well if there was something strong from outside showing those flaws. But I think that's also why it's so important to, within your own tool, within your own project, be trying to come up with the flaws and find them yourselves because yeah. it's a lot easier to digest when you find it you talk through it, you figure it out, and you can go through the motions of actually making the changes rather than not finding it and someone externally having to to tell you about it. It's a lot trickier to ingest them. But... Well, absolutely. But I mean, even then, uh, we got a disclosure, um, I want to say in July, uh, no, June, June 15th, we got a disclosure um, from uh, a source who said, we found 5,000 cases of address reuse within postmix spends this is serious right like we do not want we and not only is it serious it's really embarrassing if true because we made a disclosure about the same thing in wasabi wallet um to which they didn't fix it but but it would it'd still be like egg on your face right like you make this disclosure about address reuse and then here are five thousand instances of address reuse within your mixer it's very serious and and gut-wrenching in fact but we didn't ignore it we didn't say no. We launched a month-long detailed analysis of every single post-mix transaction that has ever been made and broke down all the different levels of address reuse and what types of address reuse. Was it user-initiated? Uh, user Was it a fault of the system? And at the end of this, we had a list of, I believe, about 200 instances of address reuse. So we had an initial sample of 5,000 and okay, after everything and our analysis is actually, it's, it's like uh, 200. Okay, well 200 is way too much still. So we need to obviously solve for that, which we've done. We've implemented fixes for it. We came out to the community and said, we fucked this up here. You know, there's some sort of network issue. And in order to fix that, we've implemented something on the node side that will just reject address reuse in, in its entirety. So here was the issue. Here was the original disclosure. Here were the results of our investigation of the original disclosure. And here's what we've, we've done as a result of it. That's how you respond to this sort of things. Even though it was a massive discrepancy in the severity of the reported disclosure versus what was actually discovered, that doesn't matter. Something was discovered and you fix it. For sure. Yeah, I think it's important to... I think you're, you, you know, that our culture tries to be like that too, or we, we try to do the same thing um, where if someone mentioned like every day, they're like, oh, we broke 90% of Monero transactions. We're like, well, were they all pre-ring CT, right? <laughs> like like what, what's, what's going on here? Um, but of course we still want to listen. Um, are there any final thoughts that you have, Samurai? I, I know it's been a little long, but also it's the first time we've really had one of these. So I think that's fine. Oh, I, time flew right by. 
I didn't even notice. I know, uh, right? I was actually, I was actually I looking for the uh, Monero paper that we we used and researched heavily on on this disclosure, in fact, and and referenced, uh, which was um, I I believe it was uh, 2014, was it, uh, where the lack of randomness on uh, on mixins um, contributed to to some level, uh, and it wasn't even you know that serious, right? But some level of de-anonymization and. And the fact is, there was still randomness in the selection of mixins. It just wasn't good enough. Uh, so we yeah, reference this. <laughs> we reference this, and this is an old paper. Uh, we reference this as a, as as a to, to correlate to what this this means for Wasabi, where there's zero randomness in coin selection, and the implications of that is enormous. And and we were able to use that paper, um, and I, I mean, I don't know how the Monero community responded to it. I don't know anything about whatever drama or non-drama was created because of it. I just read the paper. Um, but, you know, I, as far as I'm aware, that that issue was patched or, or solved for or some other some other means uh, of solving for that issue. So, you know, that's that's what we expect with this type of thing. And, and it's kind of like this burying our head in the sand thing is just it's really puts everyone at detriment um, because, you know, the it's just, it's, just, it's, it's, we already have enough to contend with on Bitcoin. We don't need any of this other crap to deal with, right? Like we need solid engineering. We need, when bugs are found, they're fixed. When users, users of protection is put first and foremost, we have to deal with what cards we have in our world. And, and you guys have a different set of challenges. You have a different set of trade-offs that you make. You have different protections for users and a lot opens up different doors and different types of things that you guys can do. Um, so yeah, I think that's it. Awesome. Well, of course, Seth and I would love to, well, we'd like to thank you for coming on. This is a lot of fun. Hopefully we will continue to have conversations going forward. Seth is our minion here in the Monero community who we use to, to test out all the other, the, all the other <laughs> privacy walls, apparently. We, we don't even ask him to do these things. He just goes and does it. So, well, the the, the report that Seth created on on Whirlpool was very very valuable for us, um, especially from the perspective and of I, I mean I, I consider you a Bitcoin user, Seth, because you use you use Bitcoin, um, but but you're more active or involved in the Monero community, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, so having that outside perspective um, is valuable, really valuable, and, and the UX concerns and. The confusion around fees, I believe it, you had some confusion around fees and and you're not alone. You know, this is something that we need to improve on and, and explain to people better. And, and, you know, so that was that was really, really helpful. So we do appreciate that. And anytime you want to you want to do that again, we're quite happy to, to take your report, whether the findings are, are good or bad. Yeah. Yeah. No, that was a, it was a great learning experience for me. And it's one of those things where, like, I try to stay involved with things outside of Monero to see what, even if I think that like, I don't want to use something long-term, uh, there's always things that I can learn about how UX works, about how certain privacy gotchas work that can either I can bring back to Monero or just learn for myself so that I can have a better understanding of the space as a whole. And that was really useful there. And I'm hopeful that other people would do the same with Monero's tools as well to figure out where there's gaps that we're not seeing because we're just, we're heads down in Monero all the time. So maybe we're missing things that a user who's not used sure. to Monero would see coming into it, so. Definitely. Well, I'm happy to, I'm happy to chat any other time, guys. Um, if you want to do another, another thing, another interview or some other different format of anything, I had a, re a really nice time uh, chatting with you, so. Yeah, yeah, awesome. thanks for coming on. Yeah, thanks, we'll see you, uh, see you soon. All right. Take care. Bye. Bye.